The internal brain. In this video we'll take a look at some of the major structures inside of the brain. First we'll look at the thalamus. The thalamus is a relay center. All sensory information passes through it on its way to and from the cerebrum. It performs a gatekeeper function. So nerve impulses traveling up the spinal cord and headed for the cerebrum must first pass through the thalamus before they can go up to the thinking parts of our brain. Information from our eyes will pass to the thalamus before being relayed to the appropriate locations within the brain, for example the occipital lobe. Information from our ears passes through here. All sensory information passes through the thalamus, gets sorted and gets sent to the appropriate part of the thinking part of our brain or the cerebrum. The thalamus affects things like consciousness, temperature, the degree of awareness of pain, and emotions. It's affected by drugs. It's affected by opiates like morphine and heroin. Um, and it's also affected by natural painkillers, the endorphins, which are in fact neurotransmitters. Tranquilizers block synapse activity here, reducing anxiety. The thalamus connects to the reticular formation. So let's take a look at how the reticular formation or the reticular activating system functions. The reticular formation is a complex network of fibers within the medulla, pons, midbrain, thalamus, and hypothalamus. What this means is that nerves in this area are connected to each other and function as a unit. What sorts of things do they do? Well, a major function of the reticular formation is to create nonspecific arousal of the cerebral cortex to incoming sensory information. And it's selective. For example, unusual environmental conditions awaken you. Let's say you get a new apartment and it's uh, right next to SkyTrain and you're used to having a very peaceful sleep. Every two minutes SkyTrain comes by and you hear it start up and start moving away. And if you're asleep, your reticular formation would alert you to this and wake you up and let you know that something different is happening than what you usually have occurring when you're sleeping. And over time you would become used to the sound, hopefully, and it, you would no longer be aroused because the reticular activating system would come to know it as something routine and something that the higher brain or the cerebrum doesn't need to be aroused out of sleep from. Another example would be if you're asleep and the regular things are happening, the furnace comes on, it turns off, these things don't wake you up. But suppose there was an unusual sound or the smell of smoke. The reticular activating would sort that sensory information and allow it to get through to the cerebrum to arouse you or wake you from your sleep because this is an unusual type of stimulus for the situation and the reticular formation would sort of make the decision that the cerebrum should be alerted and you should become consciously aware of it. In general, the reticular activating system is responsible for wakefulness and along with the hypothalamus it's responsible for consciousness. The reticular activating system can be blocked by hypnotic drugs. A disturbance of normal communication between the reticular formation and the cerebral cortex results in epilepsy and this can either result in a petite mal seizure where the reticular formation can't transmit and the cerebrum can't receive information and it results in momentary numbness or tingling or it can result in a grand mal seizure where the cerebrum is overexcited and reverberation signals in the reticular formation are the result. The result of this is convulsions and loss of consciousness and in the end brain fatigue. After a grand mal seizure uh, the person would need to uh, rest in order for the brain to recover. Next we'll take a look at the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus is a small but important region of the brain. It's the major regulator of the autonomic nervous system and homeostasis. It contains neural centers for hunger, thirst, osmotic pressure, blood pressure, body temperature and sleep regulation. It re regulates secretions from the pituitary gland and it plays a part in emotions such as anger, pain, pleasure, fear, sex drive and rage. The hypothalamus actually produces antidiuretic hormone and oxytocin both of which are stored in the posterior pituitary gland. Let's take a look at the medulla oblongata. 
The medulla oblongata contains vital centers which are important for maintaining vital functions such as breathing, vasoconstriction, and heart rate. It contains reflex centers for vomiting, coughing, sneezing, hiccups, and other functions. All descending and ascending motor and sensory tracts between the spinal cord and the brain must pass through the medulla. These tracts cross over so that the left side of the brain receives sensory information from the right side of the body and vice versa. The limbic system. The limbic system is an interior loop that connects the portions of the frontal lobes, temporal lobes, thalamus and hypothalamus. It's involved in emotions and pain. Depending on the area stimulated, rage, pain, pleasure, sorrow, affection, sexual interest, or other emotions are experienced. These emotions guide the individual to behavior which increases the chances of survival. The limbic system is also involved in memory. Finally, we'll talk about the cerebellum. The cerebellum is not a part of the internal cerebrum, but we'll discuss it here. The cerebellum coordinates complex movement. Here's how. It receives information from proprioceptors uh, in joints, muscles, tendons, and these tell the cerebrum what the position is of the body in space. It, it also receives information from the cerebrum. It compares this information to check to see that the movement of the body is as the higher brain requests. So, for example, the motor region of the, the cerebrum might initiate a, mo a movement to uh, write with your pencil or to do a particular motion with the leg. That information passes through the cerebrum and it goes down the spinal cord to the muscles that are required to, to create that movement. Information from proprioceptors return back from that region and they bring information about what the body is actually doing. And the cerebrum checks that, compares it to the information about what the higher brain, the, cere the cerebrum actually wanted the body to be doing and it makes adjustments if necessary so that the movement is actually a coordinated movement. The cerebellum is also responsible for maintaining muscle tone and posture and it's also involved in balance. It does this by assessing information from the ear and sending appropriate signals to the muscles. In this video we've looked at the internal brain and discussed the role of the cerebellum. In the next video we'll take a look at how the spinal cord functions and its role.